Okay, so getting to, uh, uh, to prepare for the last six to eight weeks for a lecture called My Journey as a Scholar of Faith has been really a pleasure. And it's a time to look back on life and, and see the hand of God in, in life, but in this case, particularly in my professional life. And with that perspective, I've seen things that I have really not noticed before because sometimes you get you know, in day-to-day -day things, but now to look over the years, you can see things that developed, you can see how things worked out maybe differently than I anticipated. And uh, because of the, my journey, I'm gonna tell a lot of personal stories, uh, but the theme is that God can make more of our lives than we can make ourselves. And I've seen places where I prayed with, uh, with faith, and my prayers were answered differently than what I expected. And then I'd find out that God's plan was better than my plan in the end. So in the most recent uh, general conference, President Nelson said, I reaffirm, reaffirm a found teaching of President Ezra Taft Benson. Men and women who turn their lives over to God can discover that he can make a lot more out of their lives than they can. All right, so my journey began here in Portage, Utah. It may be true that some of you have no idea where Portage is, okay? And I'll try not to be offended, but uh, it's a small town, a few hundred people in northern Utah, right nestled right up against the Utah-Idaho border. And this was a wonderful place to begin a journey of faith. Uh, early pioneer uh, settlement, uh, people with strong faith and made a profound and lasting influence on my life. And at that time is a time when uh, I made decisions that now, with perspective, I can see that those decisions made early in life have made all the difference in the world. So it's a time when I grew my faith, my testimony, and, and made decisions that today, in today's words, we'd say made commitments to stay on the covenant path. Decisions to be a faithful member of the church in my life. Decisions to make simple commandments, keep simple commandments like keeping the law of uh, the Sabbath and, and obeying the word of wisdom and other things. Those might seem like very simple things, uh, but those things and habits like uh, making a commitment for daily uh, scripture study and prayer, those little things add up over life and you realize in time that those are the things that made a difference of being able to, to have the spirit and, and not get into things that would have caused grief and sorrow. Well, a great place to start a, uh, a journey of faith may not be what you think of as a starting place for a scholar, okay? I knew very few people who graduated from college. I knew no engineers, okay? I'm a professor of mechanical engineering. And not only that, I, to be honest, I thought engineers were people who drove trains. <laughs> okay, so, uh, so now we make the first point in my theme of God can make more of our lives than we can. At that time, as a faithful young man, and I, as I prayed, and I'm sure I was praying, I could not have prayed to have this life that I have found so meaningful and so rewarding because I did not know such a thing existed. And I'm sure I was probably playing even some specifics. And if I was, uh, I'm glad God did not answer those in a way that I probably wanted them to be answered at the time. And, uh, and that's uh, an example of how God has blessed my life and blesses all of our lives in ways that maybe we don't anticipate. 
Well, uh, two things of growing up in Portage that, uh, that I learned that did help on this uh, journey as a scholar. One is I learned who I was, my traits and what my interests and talents were. And for instance, I learned that I'm very easily bored. Okay, and I like to do new things and try new things, have new experiences. That's a very dangerous thing if not coupled with this commitment to the gospel. Okay, and uh, but I also uh, found that I just love discovery, right, of doing new things. I, I love to hike in the mountains around Portage, and, and I'd be sometimes out in the wilderness, uh, far away from any, any other human. It's a great place to, to think and to ponder and pray. Uh, but sometimes I'd step in a spot and think, no other human has probably ever stepped in this spot. And that would just, for some reason, give me a thrill. And, and I like to do things, new things, things that have never been done. And I also learned that I love to learn, and I read a lot, and I had two hours a day on the school bus. Okay, we used to live in Portage, and especially when your mom and dad are your bus drivers, right? Uh, and I, but I read and I studied, and it was, uh, and I also later in life learned, in addition to loving to learn, I loved like to teach and help other people learn. Well, uh, this, that's the first thing. The second thing is, is learning to work. Did a lot of manual labor, uh, farm work, and also uh, did construction building those metal grain bins you see on, on farms uh, and built those all over northern Utah, southern Idaho. And I learned to work and how to get things done. I also learned that I did not want to do that the rest of my life. <laughs> and I didn't know, I did not know what that meant, but I suspected that college was on that path. Well, so uh, went to Bear River High School in uh, Tremont, Utah. And uh, this, I mean, this is a big, they had a traffic light and everything. I mean, that's, <laughs> and so, uh, and I remember being in biology class and loved the science classes and, and my lab desk was back towards the back. And up front, towards the right, was another lab desk and there sat a cute girl uh, named Peggy Rhodes. And so it was not what I practiced. So, uh, <laughs> but uh, she was beautiful, she was smart, she was good and uh, and she had this certain air of, of class and elegance that was uncommon. And I found that very attractive. And now why she would even uh, talk to some uh, shy and some a weird combination of a nerd and a country kid, right? It was just weird. And, but fortunately she did. And, and we dated some in high school. And, and, and I had to borrow, literally I had to borrow that suit from a friend, but. Uh, <laughs> Uh, and fortunately, she was still single when I returned from my mission, and we were married. And there is no other decision in my life that has made a bigger difference in the, my quality of life and in every other aspect of my life. Her love, her support, uh, her friendship, and we understand each other. And. Everything in my life that's good that's happened, including in my professional life, is because of this uh, love and support from Peggy. Okay, it's another way that God has helped me in ways beyond uh, that, what I could do on my own. Well, uh, uh, my father was a very intelligent man, uh, but never had the opportunity to, to go to college, but he wanted me to go to college. And he'd often ask me, he says, Larry, where do you want to go to college? And it wasn't until my 30s that I think I finally realized what he was doing. He never asked me if I was going to college, only where I was going to college. And, and I always gave the answer of, of BYU. And I don't know, I literally had never stepped on campus. And, but I had this feeling that, that this was something special. And the affiliation with the church was something unique. And that's where I wanted to go. And, uh, but I was a first generation student, fifth of seven uh, kids and, and in a large family. And, and I needed you know, a scholarship and things to, uh, to go, afford to go to school. 
And I did something I would never advise anyone else to do. I only applied to one school. And I needed to get, not only get admitted, but I needed a scholarship. And fortunately, by the grace of God, that all worked out and, and I made it to BYU. Now imagine this kid from Portage showing up on campus, on this huge campus, right? And this mass of humanity all compiled, in my view, you know, all compiled on this little clump of, of campus. And the one building of Helaman Halls that I lived in had more people than my hometown. And, and for this kid that loved to learn and walking into the Lee Library and seeing floor after floor and row after row of books, it was wonderful. And the discussions we had in the classes. And, and uh, well, uh, uh, first semester, I worked as hard as I ever worked in any, any other semester, uh, had my easiest schedule and got my worst grades. Okay, and, and it wasn't that I was goofing off. It was just I was a first-generation student. I was figuring out college. I did not even know what a credit hour was, for crying out loud. And it was, and, but it was a wonderful experience. You know how in life you kind of grow gradually usually, and then occasionally there's these spikes. And this was one of those spikes. And I grew intellectually, socially, and spiritually. It was a wonderful experience. And I remember one day I was sitting there in my dorm studying and, and just reflecting. I was just loving this experience and how things were going well and I was enjoying it. And I sat back in the chair and was reflecting on this. And I had what is still one of the most distinct revelations I've ever had in my life. I knew at that moment, because the Spirit testified to me, that my parents were praying for me. If I would have thought for one second, I would have known, of course, my parents were praying for me. But, uh, but I hadn't thought. <laughs> and that revelation uh, told me and helped me understand that I was being blessed beyond my capabilities because of the righteous prayers of my parents. Well, I was excited to go on a mission and, and uh, was called to Finland. And uh, what an amazing thing, right? Amazing spiritual experience, but also kind of a grand adventure, sending this kid off to some you know, unknown place in the world. And, and it still, to this day, is one of the hardest things I've ever done, right? It's a challenging language, a brutal climate, a very different culture, and, but I wouldn't change uh, the experience for anything. So I explained to people, this wasn't just a life-changing experience, this was a life-defining experience. I'm, I'm a different person because of having had that experience. And, uh, and a weird thing happened. I came home, by the time I got home, and I knew I wanted to be an engineer. Uh, and I take that as a, a, pro, a fulfillment of the scriptural promise that if you lose yourself, you can find yourself. And I know people tell me, oh, you're exposed to engineers in Finland and stuff, and I know that was true, but it was uh, all part of that blessing. So I uh, go back to BYU. Uh, Peggy and I are uh, married just as she's uh, just after she graduated in, in accounting, and uh, and at a time when there weren't that uh, many women, you know, studying accounting. And she worked for uh, Squire and Company in Orem that you may be familiar with until I uh, graduated and we moved. And uh, so she handles all of our final family finances. I don't mean some of our finances, I mean all of our finances, <laughs> and it's awesome. Okay, so, uh, so, and I had wonderful faculty who are great examples of faithful Latter-day Saints, and also taught us that we should be seeking for, uh, the, you know, the guidance of the Spirit in all of our lives, including in our professional lives. And I'm not sure I'd understood that before. And that, that guidance helped me uh, in the next parts of the world throughout my, throughout my life. And I could still repeat some of the stories and stuff these, the, the you know, professors had told. Well, uh, I had three professional goals. Get an advanced degree. I was thinking of a master's degree. I'll publish something and get a patent. Okay? For a first-generation student uh, from Portage, that was, those were pretty big professional goals. And... Uh, 
And I was fortunate to have what today we would call an experiential learning experience. There was a professor, uh, well, the, there's a new technology coming out called CAD, Computer Aided Design. And there's faculty that had relationships with the companies that were doing this. And, and so we had access to these software tools before uh, most other universities. I took an elective class and <coughs> the, uh, uh, on that topic. And then Professor Doran Wilkes invited me to be his teaching assistant and help him create uh, teaching tools and stuff for uh, uh, for this new uh, class, and so of course, if you want to learn something, you teach it, and that was that was great, and it helped me in the next phase, which was getting a job. So as I was graduating, we we're in the Cold War. Uh, engineers were in high demand, had multiple offers from uh, from different companies, and we got clear. Uh, re inspiration of what that we should accept a job in Fort Worth, Texas, for a company called General Dynamics. So now it's Lockheed Martin, but and uh, I got to work on this project. Which so for it's the YF-22, which is the first prototype of the F-22 uh, Raptor. So for a kid who liked to do new things, do things that had never been done before, and to get to design a fi supersonic fighter jet from scratch, okay, how cool is that? And so this was a, an amazing opportunity. And they told us, uh, there's me and a kid from Texas A&M, they'd hired, and they said we were the first two straight out of school they'd ever, that they'd ever hired straight out of school for an advanced project like this. And part of it was because of that experiential learning opportunity. Well, another reason we had gone here is the, the company had this uh, program where I could get a, a master's degree that let you off work uh, uh, to take classes uh, by closed circuit TV from local universities, the, the early days of remote. And then you had to make up the time that they'd pay your tuition and it seemed like a great way to fulfill this goal of getting a master's degree. Well, uh, uh, and the job, uh, you know, I got to interact with a lot of other groups and other things. And, and you know, you go to a group like, uh, I couldn't even admit this existed at the time, but stealth. And you go and you say, you're serious. You can make an airplane invisible to radar. I mean, whoa, how do I get in this group? You know, and you find out they all had advanced degrees. You'd look at your other advanced topics and they all had advanced degrees. You look at your lead engineer, your chief engineer, and your project engineer, and they all had advanced degrees. And pretty soon I realized it's like, oh, okay, that's a real, I definitely, that's what I want to do, right? I, I need to do this. But we're still in the Cold War. The, the, uh, the project was really intense. I was learning a lot, but the schedules were really aggressive. And our project engineer came with, out with a memo and said, uh, Engineers to be to be working at least 54 hours a week. Uh, my chief engineer comes and said, no, nah, that's for those wimps and other groups. You need to be working at least 60 hours a week. Okay, so uh, we'd had our uh, first child, Angela and Provo. Our second child, Travis, was born in Texas. Uh, so we had family responsibilities, had a church calling and really intense uh, work schedule. And it just wasn't possible to to uh, to take classes, and and I felt you know really disappointed, right? I mean, this is one of the reasons why we felt we had had the revelation, inspiration to accept this job, and it turns out once again God's plans were were better than my own, and if I would have done that, right, getting a master's degree remotely would not have given me the kinds of experiences that I needed to be on the path that, that I've enjoyed so much. And uh, so uh, we'd been saving all of our overtime money and to for a down payment on a house. Uh, and Larry says, hey, how about we go back to school? And Peggy was supportive and off we, off we went to Purdue University. And I noticed uh, something really interesting. As I made that announcement at work, uh, it was shocking how many people came up to me uh, and said, Larry, I always told myself I was going to do that and I never did. And I began to realize how hard it was to go out, have a good paying job and then go back to school. And 
So I went to Purdue, they'd given me an opportunity to come visit faculty. And I uh, uh, went and I interviewed with faculty and one faculty member was late for his appointment. And all we had was time for him to walk me to another building for the next appointment. And a short time on a sidewalk, he starts to describe this new area called compliant mechanisms. And it was so new that they didn't even have the terminology to, to talk about it yet. And it was so, people thought it was so complex that there would never be a day that, that you could uh, even de design the simplest compliant mechanisms. But if you did figure it out, it had a lot of uh, potential. And so in that short few minutes, I had a feeling an impression that this is what I should do for, uh, for my research. And so I worked with uh, uh, my uh, PhD advisor, Ashok Mitta, uh, who was a very kind, intelligent, and uh, wonderful man and a, and a great mentor who made, has made a, a profound difference in my life through his friendship and mentoring. Well, I'm starting to research and I, we're doing, the only way we think we can solve uh, these problems is with computer simulation. And I'm working on that research. And, and then I hear about this paper written by two mathematicians and I go and, and find this paper. And it was something that was kind of related to our area and they had different reasons for solving the problem. But still, I thought, hey, we, I had to go, I had a feeling that I should go and, and find this and be good for me to understand our field better. But I go and get a, but it's mathematicians talking to mathematicians, and I just didn't understand it. And uh, and the math was stuff I never had in any of my math classes. The uh, uh, and I didn't know that we couldn't find any professors in engineering or math or that uh, knew how to do this kind of math. So in college, right, we don't just learn; we learn how to learn. So I went to the math library and pulled out the books and started to learn how to do this, and was unsuccessful in solving the problem. And so I said, okay, I need to go back to what I'm assigned to do, what I'm supposed to be doing on this research. And, and but then had another prompting, I should go back and solve this problem. And so I go back and I work on it again. And again, I'm unsuccessful. And I get frustrated after days of working and say, I need, you know, I can't spend time on this. I need to go do what I'm on my thesis, even if I solve this problem. It's it's somebody else has already done. It's not publishable. Can't put it in my thesis, right? I can't afford to spend this kind of time, and and yet uh, prompted once again to go back and solve that problem, and eventually did. And uh, and what I thought was just me learning, uh, as I I had a but I had a different reason to solve this problem. And as I plotted the these uh, equations, I discovered something that I could create a, uh, an engineering model that was much simplified, that would accurately predict those equations and would provide a way to visualize the behavior. And that became really kind of a foundation of, of not only the rest of my research, but a foundational thing in the field of compliant mechanisms. We call it the pseudo rigid body model. And also became a foundation in a book uh, that I would later write and made a lot of compliant mechanisms that people thought were impossible. You should never be able to do that uh, made those possible. And uh, advisor and I wrote uh, uh, a paper, won a best paper award, went on to be uh, uh, a journal paper, which also helped my job prospects in the future. Another time I was a busy graduate student. I'm running up the stairs in the mechanical engineering building at Purdue. Uh, come out into the stairwell, and, and there in the hall is a bulletin board. And on that bulletin board is a flyer. And that flyer is telling about a national mechanism design competition. Uh, oh, that would be so cool, you know. But, you know, I'm, I'm a full-time graduate student. Uh, now in Indiana, our third child, Nathan, was born. And so I have family response, have a time-consuming church calling. And, and this kid with the Portage Worth ethic is like, I can't squander my time. I got all this to do. I can't squander my time goofing off on a silly contest, right? And, but man, that would be fun. And it keeps coming back to me that, uh, again, just this urge, this desire to go do this contest. And I talked to Peggy about it and she's supportive. I'm like, ah, I just don't see how I could take the time to do this. It's too applied, right? To, to be part of my research and stuff. 
anyway, so uh, I'm in a class called optimization and the professor uh, says, hey, you need to have a project, but you get to choose anything that you want, you know, just that you can optimize. And then inspiration came that, oh, wait a minute, I can do anything I want. Why not choose something that can be a project for this class, but can also be an example uh, of demonstrating how to apply the theory we've been developing in our research. And I can take that example and also uh, enter into this contest. And, and there was a way to do something. And, I, and as I should have said, also, I prayed and asked Heavenly Father for that. So, but it was, not, you know, different prayers. Like, you know, this isn't that important, really. It's just something I want to do, right? Because if, if you could help me find a way to do this. Right. And that inspiration came. What I didn't realize, once again, is God's uh, plan was better than mine. That uh, that went on, you know, help me get a good grade in the class, help me uh, one first place in that competition. Uh, but then adding having that example of how to uh, how to apply the theory. Visor and I wrote a paper that uh, that demonstrated that, and that is, to this day is still one of the top five papers uh, cited in the field. And uh, and those things also helped me with my job prospects. So when we went to uh, Purdue, the goal was a master's degree, and and PhD was like a dream, not a goal. And somehow things worked out and and I was able to do a, a PhD. And most engineers, when they get a PhD, go on to uh, industry, work in like national labs and other things. But I really wanted to be a professor. And I love teaching and I love uh, research. And, uh, and as I started to interview, uh, the, my dream job okay, was be an engineering professor at BYU. Uh, but there wasn't an opening. Okay. So I interviewed and I was uh, finding uh, jobs and I had uh, one, one school that I'd already decided I was going to accept that offer if, BYU, if nothing could happen at BYU. It's a good school, people I liked, and be a good opportunity. And then I heard there's a rumor that there was a job coming open at BYU. So I, I wrote a letter to every BYU uh emmy professor that i knew and told him who reminded him who i was and and you know what i was doing and how i'd like to come to byu unfortunately uh i the job you know opened and i was able to get an interview before i had to make a, a commitment uh to the other school those of you familiar with the byu faculty hiring process okay know the next part of this story Okay, is I, I went there and the interview went well and they said all nice things and and then they said, Well, Larry, you're a nice guy and all, but uh, you know, we we may someday want to make you an offer, but with all the approval processes we have, if or when we do this, we're we're weeks and maybe months away from being able to make you an offer. Okay. And I was graduating and I had to make a decision. I needed a job, right? And here was uh, a, a great opportunity at this one school. And here was my dream job that I really wanted. But it was kind of a vague, oh, let me be there, a nice guy. But, you know, I mean, that was, you know, uh, so I was in this dilemma. And, and that semester, I was a uh, uh, teaching assistant for a new class, and I was a uh, uh, teaching assistant with a professor I never met before before this semester and but he you know we'd talk about things he knew about the the job hunt and everything and he knew about my dilemma and I swear this this honestly this happened this guy this man not LDS never been to BYU he comes in one day and says Larry uh, you're supposed to be at BYU and uh I'm going to go with Frank Kinkaprayer, who is the head of the School of Mechanical Engineering, and I'm going to get you a job as a visiting professor at Purdue so you can stay here, uh, work at Purdue until the BYU thing comes through. And that's that's what he did. And uh, once again, all of my efforts okay, weren't enough, And uh, but God's plan was better than mine. 
Well, and uh, fortunately that uh, worked out and uh, made it to BYU. And, and you know, I loved it. I loved the student centered, uh, loved the affiliation with the church and the mission and opportunity to both teach and do research. And uh, I'll tell a few stories from BYU here, but uh, but no focus on the research because we're talking about my journey as a, as a scholar. Uh, but uh, teaching's also been a, a big part of that. And a big part of that teaching, though, is not just the classroom teaching, but in the lab. And one of the most rewarding things is working with students in research. And, uh, and it's just been uh, just amazing uh, to work with these uh, wonderful students. What I didn't know is how much I would enjoy, how great it would be to work with, uh, with other faculty. And it's not that I you know, didn't want to do that. It just wasn't on my, I had not seen it modeled. And I had the opportunity to start collaborating with, uh, with people. And you know, here's what I call my boy, the boy band picture. You know, uh, uh, this is the Mechanical Design Collective. And uh, Spencer Magaby and I have worked together for, for uh, 25 years. And other faculty have worked with uh, also throughout both in our department and in the college and throughout the university and outside of the university. And uh, what that's done is given me the ability to do problems that are either bigger or broader than what I could do on my own. And, uh, and also to help uh, build rewarding friendships that have been very meaningful in my life. Okay, so uh, in, uh, in our scholarship, right, one of the big things is we do uh, peer-reviewed scholarship, meaning we take our research and we submit it to the scrutiny of our peers. And uh, and that's a great opportunity to work with students, right, to do, teach them how to do research and also to teach them how to do technical writing because there's this, you know, rewrite, rewrite sequence that happens. And that's uh, it's a really powerful uh, approach. Uh, but of all the things I could do in research, I also wanted to do those things that could, could make a difference in the world. And... And in my own way, it was one way to lay my little teeny corner of campus that I could help fulfill this last sentence in the BYU mission statement. We believe the earnest pursuit of this institutional mission will greatly enlarge Brigham Young University's influence in a world we wish to improve. And clearly that uh, one way to do that is with the students that we, that we educate and send them out into the world. But I also wanted that to be also the results of our research. We could do things that were meaningful. And as I did that, I thought about that, you know, of wanting this research to help make an impact beyond my peers. And the challenge was that this, uh, you know, this activity could potentially distract from the main uh, responsibilities of a faculty member of uh, teaching, research, and citizenship. And uh, and so, you know, felt that there was some uh, danger in that, but at the same time felt prompted that I should do some of these things. It really wasn't until I started really was talked that the three examples I'm going to use, I thought were three different things. And now I understand that they're all really the different examples of the same thing. Uh, and then I realized, wait a minute, this isn't different from my research. This is a translation of my research into other forms that people could use. And I wanted to do this in a spirit of service, that this was something I could do, that this work could go out and make a positive difference. And what I didn't anticipate, because this was in a spirit of service, that this work, uh, as people did, as I did that, that then that helped us build trust in the community and among our peers, that then, came back and helped provide the fuel, whether it was funding and, and or credibility in the research community or other things. And it's what some people refer to as a virtuous cycle. And then that uh, cycle keeps going, you know, as, as one thing helps the other thing. And again, this wasn't different than my research. It was this translated into forms. Let me give three examples. First is... 
uh, you would never advise a young faculty member in a journal discipline like mechanical engineering to write a book, okay? Uh, that's just a dumb thing to do, right? It's a lot of time and you get one line on your CV. And yet that's what I felt urged to do. And that's what I did. And I, uh, uh, and again, it wasn't uh, something different in my research. It was taking all this peer reviewed scholarship that was scattered in different journals and things in different forms and putting it together in a form that we could teach students. And it also that, uh, 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 practicing engineers could use it to do, uh, you know, to, to create compliant mechanisms. And, and again, what I didn't anticipate is how that fuels people around the country started using this book and things, right? And it, it, uh, it became actually, it's the most cited uh, work in compliant mechanisms. And uh, so it, it actually helped come back and create this fuel that fueled the rest of my research. And this is how interesting that book is. Okay, so uh, this is Chris Madsen's daughter, by the way. So, uh, all right, so a couple other examples. One is commercialization of our research. So working with the technology transfer office. So again, this was translating my work uh, from uh, into a form that could be used by industry. Right, as saying some of the things we've developed new theory, we can now do things that no one's ever been able to do before. And but it wasn't accessible to them. And we sometimes demonstrate that theory in examples. And those examples sometimes had commercial value. So we work with the Office of Technology Transfer. And these are just some examples of things that we've licensed uh, to companies over the years. Uh, another form of translation is what is called public uh, scholarship which is where we translate it even more broadly, where uh, the public can understand it. So uh, Jenny showed the uh, museum exhibit we had at BYU. That was origami art from around the world. And then we supplemented that with our origami applications and, and engineering design. Uh, this is uh, the, the cultural center of the embassy of Japan in Washington, DC did an exhibit on our work and and it traveled to other places too. And hey, engineer, I have absolutely no business doing a museum exhibitions, okay? Uh, but it was a lot of fun. And it was also in this virtuous cycle. And then working with the media, working with university communications and, uh, and you know, our work has shown up in, uh, in places like Newsweek and Scientific American and Popular Science and, Smithsonian Magazine, and and uh, this picture is when uh, the PBS show uh, Nova came to to highlight our our work in one of their episodes, and it's also a great experience for students to kind of see this translation, and it's been fun to also see this in that virtuous cycle of people now instead of us going out and telling them why they should give us money to fund our research they are finding us and uh, that's been a, a real blessing. So once again, uh, starting out in some of these things and thinking, oh, this could be a distraction for my work and then finding ways, being inspired to find ways to have uh, that actually uh, strengthen our, our scholarly work. Okay, one, uh, Last thing, the experience of BYU's academic administration, okay? I've served as department chair, uh, associate dean, and now as associate academic vice president. Those of you that know BYU will know three things in common with those positions. It didn't apply for any of them, okay? They were all appointed. And so that was other times where it was different than my what the path that I was choosing but also felt prompted that I should accept those opportunities. It's been great opportunities for service. Uh, I've had the opportunity to work with amazing administrators. Uh, and also it's been a lot of fun to work with people around campus and see the breadth of what people do and the way that people uh, you know, work with students and solve problems. And it's, uh, it's been a wonderful opportunity. And you might not believe this. I actually told this to Peggy last night as I came home after four hour AVP council and said, wow, I walked away from that meeting feeling the spirit and feeling uplifted. 
and uh, just great people that, uh, that we work with there. Well, uh, there'll be a day when I'm going to stand before the judgment bar of God. Uh, I'm pretty sure he's not going to ask me how many classes I taught and how many papers I published. And, but I do suspect that he's going to ask how I serve people. Uh, if I was a good steward of the talents and resources that he's given me and what kind of person I've become on that journey. And uh, so he says back to where we uh, began, men and women who turn their lives over to God will discover that he can make a lot more out of their lives than they can. And I just want to testify to you that uh, that God lives, that he loves us, that he will help us on our journeys. And uh, and I leave this with you in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. And here's, you know, one of the things that's more important than some of the things, you know, all the grandkids. Matthew, my son, fourth son, fourth child, is serving a service mission, is able to be here with us today. All right, happy to answer questions if there's time. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> Yeah, I uh, decided I was wondering how much I should geek out here and talk about that. So, uh, so an example, most mechanisms, things that move, you know, like a machine, like uh, uh, you know, this door hinge here, right, has hinges where things move. And I mean, that's not a uh, a mechanism, but it's a simple example of something with hinges. And but a compliant mechanism would be something where we get motion from things rather than with hinges or bearings but with things that bend and deflect. So you think of uh, nature, uh, an elephant's trunk or a shark swimming. There's no hinges or bearings in that, right? Or a, a tail of an animal. Uh, those are all examples of compliant mechanisms. Uh, a bee is a phenomenal compliant mechanism, right? Is, is you have in one insect, very small uh, package, something with its own uh, you know, flight system, aviation system, you know, navigation, reproduction, defense system, all in that little package. And that's possible because the functions are integrated together in uh, that B, which is what we can do with compliant mechanisms. And uh, the right flyer, actually, if you get a chance to see the right flyer in the Smithsonian, they have a little description of how they got their, their control services with uh, wing warping. And so it's how they, uh, you know, how they controlled the aircraft. And then when Curtis came out with the aileron, which are just the flaps, you know, uh, pivoted on a hinge, that was so much easier that everybody went to ailerons. And that's what you're familiar with. Uh, and the re thing that the problem with the wing water is just so complex. It's the, you know, all these functions of lift and control surfaces were integrated. And, but now people with our with the things that have been developed in compliant mechanisms, people have actually been going back to the wing warping and there are been tests and Edwards and stuff to, to actually do that. So I don't know, there are some examples. So, uh, and also at the microscopic level, I didn't show any pictures of that, but we can go to very, very small devices where it's not feasible to make other kinds of things. So I got to be careful. I'll be, I'll be all day talking about compliant mechanisms. Mike? So I'm director of technology translation. Uh, uh, oh, thanks. So he reports to me now. And that, that was a sad day. <laughs> <laughs> nice comeback, yeah. yeah. <laughs> Anything else? Yeah. So, so many of your life experience, thank you. Anybody, you know, with mother too. If there was one thing you could tell your younger self, when you were just starting out, what would you tell? Uh, you know, don't stress about it, you know? And I'm pretty, pretty high strung at times, right? And don't beat up on yourself, 
You know, there are times when, you know, I've shown the successes here. Another theme could have been how to be resilient in failure. You know, I've, I've written many more unsuccessful proposals for research proposals than I've written successful proposals, right? And, you know, and other things. But uh, yeah, there are times, you know, just to know, hey, you know what? It's going to work out okay. And uh, there are times, uh, so there's research funding, the fuel, the research and engineering is one of the most stressful parts of the job. And, you know, there are times when it, it's just really stressful and I get, you know, Peggy would tell you about these days, but there's two things when a new grant would come in, you know, uh, and I just I shouldn't share that, maybe how to share this publicly, but I just, in my office, I get that email and I just kneel down and say a prayer of thanks. And then I'd call Peggy. Any other questions? Okay, now I want you to know that uh, they told me I could take the whole hour, okay? And I said, no, nobody appreciates that. I wanna end, I wanna end in time to have questions and people be out, you know, in the 50 minutes. So, uh, okay, thank you. <laughs>